This is Diana Sullivan in Austin, Texas, and today I've got another interesting machine to demonstrate. This one is a Studio Model 150 Chunky Knitter, and here's my instruction book, and I have written on here that this is identical to the Toyota 310, except for the branding on it. So if you uh, learn about a Toyota 310, well, this will give you a little overview of that one as well. Everything the same except the name plates. Now this is a simple, non-patterning, bulky machine. And I think the first thing to talk about with a bulky machine or a chunky knitter is how thick of a yarn can I use. The typical thickness of the yarn you would use. This is called worsted weight or group 4 yarn. It's also commonly by Americans called four ply yarn and you see it in all the big box stores. Here's a novelty yarn I've been playing with lately. This is Haiga Fur from Red Heart. This is a bulky eyelash yarn and the reason it goes through is because the center of the yarn is really quite skinny and the eyelash makes it bulky. All the extra fuzz and, and fur makes it bulky. But that's a really fun yarn to use. I have also found that chenille yarn goes through the bulky machines really well. So this is another bulky yarn that will go through the machine. Now you can also go a little thinner on the yarn than this. And another thing that you can do is you can put two or three strands of a yarn together and use up thin yarns in these machines. Now this is a non-patterning machine. So we're not talking about a situation where the machine does automatic multicolor work. It does a lot of manual work. But let's look at the kinds of things that you might make with a simple bulky machine. Here's an example. This is a fringed shawl made of Karen Latte Cakes. It's kind of big. It's hard to get in the video. The fringe was made at the same time as the shawl and the yarn is self-striping but you could also make your own stripes just by changing colors. So this is a great example of something you could do with the main bed only. And then here are a couple of novelty stitches. I just finished this on a chunky machine and it is entrelac and you know it's the shaping that you do a lot of times that creates the design and it's entrelac in that beautiful chenille I was just showing you and then this one is another shawl made with seashell stitch and it was kind of a fancy yarn but um, seashell stitch is a hand manipulated stitch I'm a big knitting enthusiast, so I won't show you too many samples, but our little friend here is an example of something that can be done by making shapes and sewing them together. And this is that furry yarn I was showing you earlier. It's kind of a new yarn from Red Heart, and I seem to be on a teddy bear making binge. Um, but anyway, this little fellow is um, that fur yarn. So that's what you can do with the main bed only, but this one also has a ribber. So a ribber is a really good thing to have because you can do knits and pearls. So here's an example of an absolutely huge blanket made in full fisherman rib on a chunky machine. And this is just a very typical what we call an American four-ply yarn from Red Heart. It's an inexpensive yarn and it took four, no, three of their Super Saver balls to make this huge afghan. So anyway, that's what kind of knitting you get from it. Not a great machine for the skinny yarn, but a very good machine for warm things made of worsted weight yarn to a little heavier and a little thinner. I've rewound my yarn, I've checked it for knots, I made an easy pull ball out of it, and I've threaded it into the upper tension unit, which manages the yarn for me. By rewinding it and using the upper tension unit, I don't have to worry at all about knots or problems. There's a little clip right here on the upper tension unit where I have put my yarn. This machine 
The Studio Model 150 is a very simple machine to operate, and there are a lot of ways to cast on. I'm going to do a really lazy way. I'm going to cast on every other needle. I'm simply going to thread up. I have every other needle in work, and I'm going to go across. And you see, it put the yarn in every other needle. Then I'm going to take one of the little roots that came with it and just weight those. And I'm going to bring out the in-between needles, and then I can continue to knit. There are lots of, of other cast-ons, but this one's quick and easy, so I can do a little demo on the machine. As you knit, the purl side is what's facing you. Let me get a few rows on and hold it up and show you the knit side. Now in only a few seconds, I've knitted all these rows for this little sample. And if I flip it over, you can see the knit side. Let me zoom in and show you the knit side. And that was just a quick utility cast on. Nothing special. So you often will cast on and do a hem, or you'll do an e-wrap cast on. But that, that's one of many ways just to get you started. And then after you have some knitting room, it can be really nice to just put a small weight just on the ends of the work. Now let me show you a few stitches that you can do on this machine. We'll start with a tuck stitch. To do a tuck stitch, we need to change the setting on the carriage. These levers on the outside of the carriage have one and two on them. They're called Russell levers, and we're pushing them away from me into number one, which is what we need to do a tuck stitch. Here's a needle pusher in the toolkit that picks out every fourth needle. So let's try this out with tuck stitch. We'll pick out, starting with the fourth needle from the right, we'll pick out these needles. And if you had a lot of needles in work, you can make a huge piece of knitting really fast, but you would have to pull the needles out and work your way across. Now, when I knit across these, it doesn't knit the needles pulled out. It leaves them pulled out. So I'm going to do that four times. So that's two, three, and four. Then I'm going to push those needles halfway back, and I'm going to pull out the needle exactly in between them. And now it's going to knit the ones that are halfway back and tuck the ones that are fully extended. Doing it again, these guys go halfway back, but now I'm going to pull out the in-between ones and do it again. So this is quite a fancy stitch and doesn't take much time at all to hand pick the needle. There are a bunch of tuck stitches in your pattern manual. And there are many, many more tuck stitches you can do in other knitting books. But I'm just going to demonstrate the one. And now I'm just going to, to Go ahead and knit all the stitches so I can show you what that looked like. This plain area will make a dividing area between this and the next pattern. On the purl side, you have this rather wonderful texture. And then on the knit side, there's a, almost a popcorn texture back here. You can't really see it yet, but you will when I pull it off the machine. And there's also this fun way that the stitches meander. So that was a very tiny sample of tuck stitch. Now 
I'm threaded up with some pink yarn because I'm going to demonstrate slip stitch and it'll show up better in a solid color. In slip stitch, we set the carriage a little differently. We bring both of the rustle levers forward and we slide this over to the S. Now I'm going to create a pattern by picking out needles. There are a zillion slip stitches you could do, but what I'm going to do is really simple. I have this two stitch pusher tool. It t pushes out two and then it leaves two back. So two forward and two back. And I'm going to start with the first needle on the right and push out and knit across. It knits only the ones that I pushed out. So that first one I started with the first needle. This next row I'm going to start with the second needle. So see, this is the second needle from the right. Now I'm going to start with the third needle from the right. Then I'm going to do the fourth needle from the right, but I'm also going to get the first needle because I need to stick to the pattern of two back and the others up. And I'll repeat that first, second, third, and fourth. On the fourth one I need to get the end needle. And first, second, third, and fourth. And I'll make enough of a sample so that when this comes off the machine you can really see it. So here's what we've done so far. Let's just cut the yarn Take the knitting off the machine and show you. Notice how knitting naturally rolls when it's stockinette stitch. So this is the purl side of stockinette stitch, plain knitting. This is the knit side of stockinette stitch. This sample was our tuck stitch. This is the purl side. This is the knit side of the tuck stitch. And I just don't think the three-dimensional aspect of it is showing up in the fancy yarn. But this is almost a popcorn stitch. It's a fun stitch. Okay, the next one that I want to show you is the slip stitch. Here it is on the purl side. On the knit side, there's nothing to see here, folks. This is an example of the purl side being the right side of the garment. This machine has built-in intarsia, and I want to demonstrate that. The first thing that you're going to do with built-in intarsia is slip the carriage to the other side without disturbing the knitting. To do that, change your carriage over to the S for slip, and then it'll go across and not disturb anything. Now change the carriage over to the I setting by bringing this lever over to the I and knit across. There's no yarn in it and it will stew the setup row for intarsia. So what does the setup row for intarsia look like? The yarn is coming from the right here. The stitches were knitted two rows, of, two passes ago because I slipped over and the needles are out with the stitches behind the hooks and all the latches are open. So I'm set up. Now I'm going to use three colors of this beautiful chenille and I'm going to do a diamond. And what I'm going to do is start with the yellow, which is where the loose end of the yarn is. I'm going to do eight stitches of the gold and go over to there for four, five, six, seven, eight. You see I just laid the yarn in the hooks. Now I'm taking my next color, which is a cream color chenille. I'm putting the short end on the right, so that's my loose end. And I'm going to start on the next needle and cover it, plus cover the next hook after that. 
So that's my next uh, two stitches. Then I'm going to take the brown yarn, put the short end on the right because I'm knitting toward the left, and I'm going to lay it in the remaining hooks. So now I am set up for that first row of intarsia knitting, and I just pass the carry, and it knits the stitches that I just specified with the colors where I had them hanging on those needles. Now the next row of this diamond pattern is just the same, the same stitches in the brown, but now I'm working from left to right, laying them in the hooks. I make sure that I put yarn in every hook. I get the white long end and make sure that it's behind the brown and put it over its two hooks and get the yellow and put it over the remaining hooks. And I'm going to hold the yarn gently in my fingers and let it flow between my hand and knit. So that's that row. Now this row pattern changes a little. I'm going to do one last stitch of the gold. Then I'm going to do four needles in the white. You see how I'm bringing the new color from behind the old color and I'm always working in the direction the carriage is about to go. And then I'm going to just hold my hand against the knitting and push across. So now I have the four stitches of the white and I'm going to do the same row again with the four stitches of the white. You just take your time with this. Now I'm going to do one more stitch in the white. So that's six gold, and that's six white, and the rest brown. The next row is just the same. I can see what colors to do because I can see those colors back against the needle bed. So I had two rows like that. Now I'm going to do one wider on the white because I'm making this white diamond. So now I'm going to have eight stitches of white. And this row going from left to right is the same as the row before it. And you see, all I'm doing to feed the yarn is putting a hand against so that the, my yarn is actually held against the knitting gently. And it puts a nice amount of tension on the yarn so that it knits properly. Now I've gotten the increasing side of the diamond done. I'm going to start doing the decreasing side. So less white this time, one less on this side, and bring the gold over one more stitch, one less white, so that's on six stitches this time, and the brown is over one more stitch as well. Coming back, same layout as before, which means all I have to do is look at where the colors were before and lay in those same hooks smaller this time, we're going to go down to four stitches of white in the center. Same thing this way, four stitches of white. Now we're going to go down to two, which is where we started. You can use as many colors as you want. You can see how this is forming on the back. The back of this is even pretty. And it doesn't make holes. It winds over nicely. You would think that it would tangle, but it does not tangle. The reason it doesn't tangle is that it twists one way when you go to the left. It untwists when you go back, and it just untwists itself every other row. So it doesn't tangle, it's easy to do, and it's really quite interesting. 
Now I'm going to knit a few rows plain of one of the colors and thread the machine in the typical way so I can show you counted ferrile. Now your book has some really cute knit in ferrile samples and you can work from any chart you want. I'm just going to do something simple for a quick demonstration. First of all, we've got to set the machine properly. For the counted ferrile, we want the machine to be on slip, which is the S slide, and then we want both of the rustle levers to be out on number two. For my counted ferrile, I'm going to thread up some brown, and I'm going to have every fourth stitch be brown. Now, I'm just going to use this needle pusher and keep it simple. So every fourth stitch is brown. And I thread up with this yarn, and the only needles that are going to knit are the ones I just pulled out. So you see, every fourth stitch is brown. And I'm going to slip back to the other side and put in the background for that row. So I'm unthreading. I'm set for slip, so my carriage will go back. And then the background for that row is that all the stitches that aren't brown in my little plan are going to be the gold. And I just happen to have this needle pusher that pushes three at once. So you see, these needles are going to be gold. We're on the pearl side, so you are going to see floats. Now I've decided to step over and have the gold be over by one. So I'm just going to put, previously my gold was here, so I'm going to move over to here. And I have to do this all the way across. So there we go, I have three out and one back. When I knit back, that's where my gold is going to be. So here I go. And it put gold on those needles. Now I need to get to the other side and do this next row of brown. So I'm doing my slip and I'm threading with brown. And I need to pick out the stitches that are going to be brown. And it's this one and it's every fourth stitch. So I'm just moving over by one stitch. I'm just doing something super simple. So over I go, and that puts in my brown stitches. And then my next job is to put in my background stitches. So let me trade a yarn. I'm going to put in my gold yarn. I'm just parking the yarn I'm not using on the other side of the bed, behind, underneath the end of the bed. So the yarn that's going to be gold is all the stitches that are not brown. So here I go, these and these. They're not brown. So let me do my not browns. And that was my background for that row. Now I can do my background for the next row. And I'm just going to move over by one. And I have to stay in pattern to repeat of four stitches, so I've got to stay in pattern. And I'll knit my background all over. Unthread. Park my yarn. Get my brown into the feeder. Here we go. And then I need to pick out my brown. And my brown stitches are every fourth stitch. Just like that brown across. So I've done the brown for this row. I'm going to slip back, do the gold for this row. Gold is going to be all the stitches that are in brown. And you can do as many colors as you want. I'm just going to. Then for my next row, I'll go ahead and put in my background and then my foreground. So I've got the gold. And my next row, my brown will be here, so my gold will be these. Yep, making it up as I go, and I might make a mistake. You would probably work from a chart. So that's my background for that row. 
And then let me get my pattern for that row. Pick up the brown. And each stitch that is not gold is going to be brown, so that'll be this one, plus every fourth one after it. So these are my browns. And so on. That's how you do hand picked ferrile. And I'll do a few more rows just using gold and um, bind off so we'll have a nice swatch. Wonderful machine, really smooth knitter. So I want to bind off, and I'm going to bind off with a transfer tool. I'm just going to move the second stitch onto the end needle and then move both stitches in. This is one of many ways that you could bind off. And then I'm going to move the second stitch to the end again. Move both in. And then I hand knit through that needle. Didn't do that quite right. Didn't go through. Here we go. There, that's better. And second to the end. Move that stitch over to the end. Well, I've had a great time playing with this machine, and I haven't even played with the river yet, so that'll be next. If you want to learn lots of cast-ons and bind-offs and increasing and decreasing and short rolling and making a shoulder, that is all in my beginner course, which is on YouTube, and then I've got a remastered high-def one that I sell at dianaknits.com. But I just wanted to try out all these basic functions on this nice little bulky machine. I really like to see people learn on a bulky machine because it's so easy to see the needles. And when it's easy to see, it's easier to understand what the machine is doing. So I'll finish my bind off, come back, and show you the finished piece. So here's my sample. This was my utility cast on. And uh, it'll gather up, but it won't unravel. It's a good cast on for things like samples and, and uh, gauge swatches. Here's my diamond that I did with Intarsia. Looks good on the front, looks good on the back. And then here was my hand picked Fair Isle. I mounted a ribber on here and made a big, big sample. This is a typical cast on. And I guess it should hold it in the order that I that I knitted it. So this was knit one purl one rib. And then I went to full needle rib or double rib, which is where you use every needle on both beds and they're close together stitches. And then this is a knit two purl two rib that's industrial. And when I say industrial, I mean the stitches are closer together and it's super stretchy. And then here is some more knit one pearl one ribbing. This is English rib, very pretty rib that is, um, it's tucked on one bed every other row. This is full fisherman rib and it's tucked on one bed every row. So one row it'll tuck on the ribber and the next row it'll tuck on the main bed. I finished up with a little more knit one pearl one ribbing and a nice cast off. So that was my test piece on the ribber, but let me just demonstrate it a little bit. The ribbing attachment is like a whole second machine that is here, and it does the purl stitches, and this part up here, the main bed does the knit stitches. And then it has an additional carriage, and then this piece, the ribber arm that carries the yarn. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the zigzag row. It's done from left to right. But before I go over there, let me show you the settings so that you'll know how I set that. This is all going to be on plain knitting, but I turn it all the way down on the tension to the R mark. I do that on both carriages. These are up and forward, and these are down. I'm going to run over to the left. I'll thread it with some light yellow yarn, and then do a zigzag row from left to right. The zigzag row 
makes this cast on and it's used for many kinds of ribbing. So since it's the most common, that's what I'll demonstrate today. Zigzag row from left to right. And now I need to hang a comb. This is what the comb looks like. It comes up between the beds and I remove the wire, at least partially, and put it so that it is in between all those stitches and then push the wire back in. Now I'm going to hang two large weights. When we do ribbing, we use these big one pound weights. We get a lot of help from gravity. There are little holes on the comb that I find with my fingers and hang the weights on. To set the carriage up for the next three rows, which are also part of the setup, both of the tension dials go to zero. And I lift up this on the bottom carriage. It goes from one to zero. This cam lever right here. And I knit to the left. It will knit on the knitter only, not the river, for this row. Now when I knit back, I want it to knit on the river only, so I slide this lever over to the S and I knit back. For the next row, I want it to knit on the main bed, so I put this back on the zero, and I leave this lever up down on the river, so it'll knit on the main bed only. For that regular stitch, I adjust my tension. I'm going to do tension four, and I bring this lever on the side of the river. I push that down because I'm going to knit in both directions. Make sure this is set to knit in both directions, and I go back and forth, and that makes ribbing. So as I knit to the right, it knits every stitch, knit purl, knit purl, knit purl. Same on the left, knit purl, knit purl, knit purl, and it grows very quickly. I'm going to put a few rows on so that I'll have a good sample to show you. Now I'm going to change the setting and do some English rib because it's a very popular stitch and I just thought it would be fun to demonstrate something a little different. I lift this lever up from the 1 to the 0 on the left side only of the river. It's going to tuck to the left only. I also slide this to the right to the eye mark and then I can knit to the left and it will tuck on the river when I go to the left. I push to the left the ribber needles have two loops in them. They didn't knit through. Those were tuck stitches. And the main bed knitted through as usual. But when I go to the right, it knits everything. So I'm going to do a few more rows of that so I'll have a good sample to show you. I'm finishing my sample by one row of plain knitting, very loose, and then I'm going to bind off. So that was my loose row. I'm going to transfer all the stitches up to the main bed. The river comes with this tool that's like a needle but with eyes on both ends, and I can transfer river stitches on up to the main bed needles quickly and easily with this tool. So I'll transfer all these stitches to the main bed and I'll be right back. My stitches are all on the main bed. I'm taking off those heavy weights and I'm dropping the ribber. It has these brackets on the end and I can push the buttons and drop things right off. Now I'm going to bind off the ribber stitches. This is just a latch tool bind off. There are lots of ways to cast on and bind off with a ribber, but I just thought I would show one common way. And I'm just sort of crocheting these a loop through a loop using this latch tool. This is the little sample I just made. This is the knit one, purl one ribbing, and then this is the English rib. English rib looks different on the other side. It looks plain on that side and fancy on this side. 
you'll note that it is significantly thicker and wider than plain ribbing and just a very popular thick worm stitch for blankets and garments. So that's the operation of the chunky 150 ribber.